All right, let's take a look at this just, just in time purchasing relevant benefits and relevant costing problem, problem 20 29. We have the Margro Corporation, and it's an automotive supplier that uses automatic turning machines to manufacture precision parts from steel bars. Okay, the company's raw steel averages $600,000, and John Oates, the president, and Hellman Gorman, the controller, are concerned about the cost, the costs of carrying inventory. The steel supplier is willing to supply steel in smaller lots for no additional cost. Gorman identifies the following effects of adop adopting a JIT inventory program to virtually eliminate steel inventory. All right, now the first bullet point says, without scheduling any overtime, lost sales due to stockouts would increase by 35,000 units per year, but if they incur overtime premiums of 40,000 per year, the increase in the lost sales could be reduced to 20,000 units per year, and that would be the maximum amount of overtime that would be feasible for the company. Also, they point out that two warehouses currently used for steel bar storage would no longer be needed. The company rents one warehouse from another company under a cancelable leasing arrangement at an annual cost of $60,000. The other warehouse is owned by Margro. It contains 12,000 square feet. Three-fourths of the space in the warehouse could be rented for $1.50 per square foot per year, and insurance and property taxes costing $14,000 per year that would then be eliminated. All right, now, they also let us know that the required rate of return on investment is 20% in Margro's budgeted income statement for the year ending December 31st um, appears as follows. And so we've got a little bit of information here with revenues of 10,800, variable cost of 4,050 and 1450, um, total cost of goods sold 5,500, yields a gross margin of 5300 then we subtract off some variable and fixed cost from marketing and distribution to come up with operating income. And then we have two requirements on this problem. Part one says calculate the estimated dollar savings or the loss um, for the Margro Corporation that were, would result in 2005 from the adoption of the JIT or just-in-time purchasing. The requirement, too, will handle, handle a little bit later, and it says to identify and explain other factors that the company should consider before deciding whether to adopt a JIT purchasing uh, uh, system or program. Okay, well, let me slide the screen down now, and we can be begin working on part one, where we're going to calculate the estimated dollar savings to the company uh, if they adopt the JIT program. All right, so let me slide this here. It'll give us a little bit of room. All right, well, the first thing we, we need to do, uh, or the first thing I'm going to do, is I'm going to recognize that there's that 20% rate of return savings. And they told us that um, if we do that, we've got a 600,000 savings of uh, going from one to the other. So let's jot that down. So I'm going to jot just a couple numbers, and I did this ahead of time just to save some time. Okay, so we've got a 20% per year times 600,000 average in inventory per year. Okay, so under the current purchasing, that's costing us 600,000, I get enough zeros here, times 20%. Right, so 120,000, and um, that would be zero in the case of uh, a JIT system because we think we're going to cut the inventory down to uh, down to zero. All right, then the next thing we need to figure out is what happens to the annual insurance and property tax cost. And I think up here they told us it was $14,000, uh, right there, right to the left of my mouse there. Uh, that's on one of, the, I think, the warehouses that, that wouldn't be needed. Um, so we're going to jot in that we're incurring 14000 with the current situation. Um, and if we go to JIT, it would be zero, right? All right, the next item to consider is the warehouse rent itself. Now, um, we've got a little, little bit to figure out here 
as to how we fa factor the warehouse rent in. Okay, we've got 12,000 square feet. Three-fourths of the space is, is owned, and it could be rented for $1.50. So that represents the opportunity cost that we need to show in our model. Remember that the opportunity cost uh, represents whatever cost they'd be used in the next best alternative. So what we know is we've got 12,000. Our current system is $12,000, or 12, excuse me, 12,000 square feet. It could be rented for $1.50, but only um, three-fourths of that. So I'll divide that by three times four. And, um, oh, let me get the dollar sign out of there. It's correcting it for me. Uh, let me bring that back up. Yeah, I don't need the dollar sign. So we do that, and we come up with um, an amount of 13500 but the 13500 is what would be saved, if you will, under just-in-time. So what I'm going to do is move that over here and show that as a negative amount. If we're talking about relevant costs, that would reduce it. Okay, so I've put that in the wrong place. I want to show what would be relevant attributable to the JIT purchasing arrangement. Okay, so there is our warehouse rental revenues is what that would be. And under the current scenario, we don't have that. The opportunity cost is it's being used uh, for that purchase. So uh, it's being used as a, as a warehouse location. So we enter zero. Okay, the next item we need to consider um, is the overtime cost. Right, let me slide and give us a little bit more room here. Okay, um, and we have a couple options. With the current scenario, there's no overtime. Right, uh, but we do anticipate having a maximum overtime premium, um, and I think they gave us that amount as forty thousand dollars. Yeah, by incurring overtime premium four thousand per year, the increase in lost sales could be reduced to twenty thousand per units. Okay, so we we anticipate having forty thousand dollars of overtime in in the JIT world. Okay. Next thing I want to kick, uh, toss out would be stock out costs, um, and I type that ahead of time. Oh, I said no overtime, but we really don't need to do that. Um, I think what I want to do is I had some things written here. I think I can just do it like that. I think we should be just fine. Okay, so the stock out cost is what we need to figure out next. And uh, we have one situation with no stockouts, um, and we have another one where we have to figure out the contribution margin per unit on the 20,000 we're going, going to lose. Um, and I'm going to actually type in the $20,000. And remember, the 20,000 units was uh, the dollar amount uh, they thought the lost sales would be reduced to 20000 under the second term. So that's an that is a relevant number that we're going to need to use. All right, well, in the current situation, there's no stuck out, so we put a zero. But then we've got to figure out a contribution margin and figure out what the dollar amount we're going to lose on the stock outs would be. Okay, and once we have that, we could compute the total incremental costs and a difference compute a difference in favor. But to do the contribution margin, uh, I'm going to jot down some calculations here we need. All right, so we need um, a unit contribution margin, so we need to co come up with the selling price. And the selling price, I believe, is 10,800 divided by how many units? Um, yeah, there's the 10,800, and this is all in thousands, of course. So, um, what I'm going to do is take uh, that 10,000, 10, it's 10,800, but it's, in, it's really 10,800,000. I'll just do it in whole, whole numbers here. And then we need to divide that by the 900,000 units. Okay, now, oh, it thinks it's text. Let me put this like that. And we come up with, uh, I think I've done that right. 10,000, I've uh, done it wrong, excuse me, I, I, missed, I need one other zero in here. 
Yeah, it's twelve dollars is our selling price. Okay, and what I the nine hundred thousand comes from right there, the revenues we had, ten million eight hundred thousand. That gets us our selling price of unit contribution margin. Then we've got to figure uh, what the variable cost per unit is. Um, in fact, I think I can slide all of this here. I'm not sure what else we need here. Uh, I think move this right here, we'll be fine. Variable cost per unit now, we need to figure out the variable manufacturing cost per unit. And how we get that is we've got to find the total cost divided by the 900,000 units. All right, it's right there at the top, the 4050, I can go up one here, 4050, again divided by 900,000 units. So that's 4,050,000 divided by 900,000 units. Okay, and we're just doing this on a per unit basis. Okay, so that comes out to be, you know, on all of these I need to put this in the comma, $4.50. Now the variable marketing cost, um, slide up again, the variable marketing cost is the 900. So that's going to be 900,000 divided by 900 units, 900,000 units. It's a dot. So we're going to wind up with a dollar per unit. Okay, that should be clear. So we can combine the total selling price to come up with a total variable cost. Um, I'll just sum that. Okay, and once we do that, we're able to compute the contribution margin, the 12 less the 550. We'll underline that, and then I will format this as a dollar with two decimal places, and we can double underline that as well. Okay, so now that we've got a $6.50 contribution margin, we can enter that in here. This is really $6.50 contribution margin per unit times 20,000 units. And that's the dollar amount of the stockout cost we're going to incur. So I'll take that $6.50 that we calculated here times the 20,000 units, which was the dollar amount of stockouts we're anticipating. All right. Once we've done that, we have all the total incremental costs, so we can simply sum from above. Um, and I think I've missed one other item on this side. I've got 12, 14,000. Oh, that where the warehouse cost. Oh yes, the 13.5 represents the incremental revenue we could get from renting out the places. But to compare that to the current purchasing power. Uh, policy, we really do, do need to include that 60,000 in there. And again, um, let's see if we can find where it says that right there. Uh, they, they rent a facility at 60,000, so that really is a cost that changes, therefore, it's a relevant cost we need to include in our analysis. So I'll add in $60,000. Okay, and uh, I'm going to put a zero in here just so I can draw an underline under both lines. So we have 194 versus 150. 50. So uh, the difference in favor, um, let, me, let me underline both of these. Is, uh, all right, so the difference we have in favor is equal to the 194 less the 156,000 or 37,5. And I'm going to double underline that because we are 37,500 uh, showing a good decision to go ahead and move to the just-in-time purchasing. All right, now if we slide back up a little bit, so number two said to identify and explain other factors that the company should consider before deciding whether to adopt a JIT purchasing. All right, and I'll just talk about these. Uh, we've done the analysis here that says quantitatively it looks like um, it looks like we are ahead by 37,500. Now keep in mind if dollars are in thousands, that's 37.5 million. But I think the cost in here were per units, only the, only the uh, balance sheet was thousands. So we're ahead $37,500 in favor of moving to a JIT purchasing power. But number two says identify and explain other factors that the company should consider. Okay, I'm just going to mention, um, I'll mention about five of one. Uh, first off, you know, you, you want management and certainly top management to be committed 
and they'll need to provide leadership support. That way we have a, a coordinated effort and uh, the company itself will be successful. In other words, the benefits of the 37500 won't just be realized on their own. Uh, we need management support, management buy-in to make it happen. Okay, another item we could talk about is that um, uh, a detailed system for integrating the sequential operations of manufacturing process probably needs to be developed and implemented. In other words, we're going to have um, less amount of material but arriving more often. So we need to figure out how, we, how that happens in a smooth and orderly way. Uh, and that way sub-assemblies can use the direct materials and the, and the whole production process will continue to operate smoothly, maybe even smoother than what we've seen in the past. Um, uh, certainly, we, we're, we're going to need accurate sales forecast, and then that way we can plan for effective finished good planning and production scheduling, right? It all follows through. If we need to know what the customer demand is, from there we can figure out uh, where we need to have finished goods, and if we know that, then we work backwards to figure out what the proper scheduling will be, given whatever inventories we have on hand. Okay, another item we could talk about is that products should be uh, designed to maximize the use of standardized parts. Now, all that does is reduce manufacturing time and cost. So the greater we can institute uh, simplifying the number of parts and standardizing the number of parts, um, the easier it is to, to, um, uh, to meet production on a, on a go-forward basis. Um, and then also we would need to find reliable vendors that can deliver the quality a quality direct material on time within the minimum lead time, right? I mean, the whole idea here is that we're expecting smaller dollar purchases and we need to take advantage of that. Well, if the if we have stockouts, then that 40,000 could become a much larger number. Uh, in fact, if it goes up by 37.5, that alone would tell us um, that the GIT wasn't worthwhile. So we need to make sure that we can control that number to 40,000 and not have it go any higher. All right, well, that's about five different things that management should consider before deciding to go to a JIT. And then, of course, the number down here takes care of number one. Thanks, everybody.